Our first speaker is Dr. Michael Parkinson. He's a senior medical director for health and productivity at UPMC Health Plan and Work Partners. Dr. Parkinson. Great, thanks Richard. Good morning, everybody. Uh, special hello to some of my colleagues from uh, UPMC and uh, the medical and public health communities in Allegheny County. It's great to see you all here this morning. I'm reminded my brother actually is a veterinarian. Uh, and as he reminded me, he said, you know, Mike, it was much tougher to get into vet school than it was into medical school. And the fact that you guys only get four hours of credit, we get seven hours of fluff, apparently. That's just another testimony to that, I guess. Um, I'm going to try to digest here in about 15 rapid minutes what is about a 45-minute discussion with physicians. Uh, the chairman of internal medicine at uh, University of Pittsburgh asked me, Mike, could you just give a talk on what should we tell our patients to eat? Our doctors are totally confused. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, <laughs> but they are. And if you've ever asked your doctor a nutrition question, you would probably know that we never were taught anything about healthy eating. And by the way, I don't use the N-word with all due respect to Dr. Who. Uh, nutrition sounds mystical, it's components, it's micronutrients. No, what do you need to eat? So healthy eating is not nutrition in my book, and I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not being critical of nutrition, but what do we do to prevent, treat, and even reverse all the diseases that Dr. Who talked about last night? They're not only killing us in the United States, but now we're literally exporting around the world as other societies become wealthier. What should we be telling our patients? You probably can't read this, but this was a 12-year-old child who was presented in Grand Rounds at our pediatric hospital about two years ago in our Lifestyle Medicine and Environmental Health Grand Rounds. A child who is already overweight, already on three or four medications, already hypertensive, already hyperlipidemic, already on the path to a shortened lifespan, and our pediatricians are pulling their hair out saying, what am I supposed to do in a 15-minute visit? This is our future in Western Pennsylvania. You heard about the pediatric obesity epidemic the Doctor Who talked about. It's living right in our backyard. And by the way, it's not the obesity per se because there are a lot of thin people who are very sick because they also have disease in their vessels and their nerves and their brain related to lifestyle. So how do we begin to address this with busy doctors who say the patient expects me to fix it with a pill? I have no time. The patient comes in, even though I know this lifestyle stuff kind of works, uh, they expect a pill. I don't have time to do anything else. We call it the Glipitor syndrome which is why we get to be one of the most over-medicated countries in the world with quick fixes for things that aren't quick or can be fixed with a pill. But it's not just the time. You can't read this perhaps, but we asked doctors, our own doctors, what are the barriers to you actually engaging your patient on healthy eating, physical activity, stress management? And what they said was, we don't know what we're doing. Number one is I don't have the time, and number two is I'm not sure what resources are available. Number three is I have inadequate knowledge and skills about the subject. They were being quite honest here. Seven to eight out of ten. Way at the bottom was pay me differently. Everybody thinks if you pay doctors differently that they'll do something different. But if I don't know what I'm supposed to do, and I don't have the resources to do it, and I don't have the time, even if I'm well-intended, I can't do it. So how do we clinically take what Dr. Who talked about last night and turn it into something actionable that benefits us as patients and rewards physicians and the staff and the nurses and the nutritionists to make a difference? Every employer in Western Pennsylvania sees this slide. If I eat largely the diet that Dr. Who talked about last night, largely plant-based, minimal meat, minimal dairy, fish, minimal processed foods, right? All of the things that we know that people in Okinawa, Mediterranean countries, Seventh-day Adventists, physician health and nurse stuff, we eat that diet. We move 30 minutes a day. I don't put exercise. You just walk. Our great-grandparents didn't exercise. They worked on a farm. They're non-smoker. Moderate alcohol use, meaning no more than one to two a day, unless the Steelers lose a game they shouldn't. <laughs> and I would put up there that I have a purpose or a friend. 91% of diabetes disappears, 80% of heart disease doesn't occur, 70% of all cancers doesn't occur, and we have got to begin to get to the root cause of these diseases, and it starts in this room. 
It starts with you understanding this slide just like employers have to. And they're saying, how can I fix this in a 15 minute visit? Here's the sad truth. In our region, our five state region, heart disease death rates have been going up since 2013. After 30 years of going down, because we decreased smoking and we came up with these wonderful things called stents, our cardiac care got better. For 30 years, we saw it go south. Six years ago, it started to go north because nutrition, obesity, and we can't get people to hospitals fast enough. So lifestyle is overcoming 30 years of cardiac death mortality rates in our region, and the numbers are keep going up. We eat upside down. If Okinawans live to be 100 without all of these diseases, we're the exact opposite. So all of the light blue bars are what the Okinawan population, this is a 30 year old slide. All of the dark blue bars are where we get our calories. Unless we shift to the light blue bars from the dark blue bars, no amount of talking, me talking to doctors is going to make your children any healthier. The food pyramid in Okinawa looks very different than the food period in the United States. The food pyramid at the Harvard School of Public Health looks different. I'll show you in a few minutes the plate in Canada, six hours north of here. We have to understand that this type of plant forward, to use Dr. Who's term, is an imperative for long life without chronic disease, and actually to reverse existing diseases that we think we can fix with pills, because we really can't. The three American food groups are added salt, added sugar, and added fat. And those are the real numbers. You can read the numbers, three and a half grams. These are, Frank probably has, has more updated numbers than I have, but it's all in largely the processed foods that we're eating as opposed to stuff that we're adding. Nobody goes home every day and said, I'd like to add some nice saturated fat on top of my carrot sticks, right? Salt, sugar, and fat. No to minimal fiber. By the way, fiber's your friend. So we're down around seven or eight grams. Probably should be upwards of 25, 30, 40 grams. It's what these countries eat, right? So raising colon cancer rates. It's all tied in together, right? Those, those slides. Meat consumption continues to go up. We're over 200 pounds per capita per year, and the numbers keep going up. And whether it's chicken, beef, pork, fish, lamb, in general, it's not plant forward. Okay, we don't have to get into particulars here, but just to know that as a society and as a community, the numbers are going actually in the wrong direction. This is the most important slide of probably the entire day, as far as I'm concerned, for physicians and veterinarians in the room, because my brother who treats inflammation in dogs and cats sees the same types of inflammatory diseases occurring because of pet foods and, what and the lack of physical activity in animals. Unhealthy diets, lack of physical activity, high stress, and believe it or not, a lot of medications that we take to treat these very conditions. Through those three mechanisms, big scientific medical words, pathways we now understand lead to inflammation. Inflammation is the common pathway to all the diseases, 90% of diseases on the right. Obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, 70% of cancers, depression, anxiety, stress, a lot of things that we now see are mediated by this thing called inflammation. This is a great news slide. 30 physicians in California put together this version of the slide, a Dr. Bodai and others, saying that if we can address this as a medical issue, we can begin to move it into the medical thinking. Busy slide, but this is a version that Dr. Who showed last night. Frank, this was so impactful when I saw this study that showed we could basically replace plant proteins with the animal proteins that we're eating because they're inherently different. Our body processes those proteins differently because they're not of an animal's basis, right? Look at the shift. There's a 60% reduction in some of these mortality rates when you move from animal-based proteins to plant whether it's cardiovascular disease, all-cause mortality. These are big number studies, well done, controlled for other risk factors, none of which Dr. Who got into last night, but everything he touches is well controlled. There's no question about the outcomes of the studies. When they looked at five million person years in the health professional cohort studies that he oversees with his colleagues, going back 30 years of doctors and nurses, what they found was that significant reduction 
this is not 10 percent this is 30 to 60 percent this is huge it's the root cause of what's causing a lot of these diseases it led the president of the american college of cardiology who by the way happened to be a vegan to say the jury is not out the jury is in if you have any cardiac event you should move all the way to 100 percent plant-based and everybody should prudently be moving more towards plant forward which is what that long editorial says at the bottom there by Drs. William and Patel. And this is in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. You cannot get more mainstream than that. So sometimes folks who come to the FIPS and folks who talk about this think we're kind of in the, the science is with us, okay? And I don't mean us versus them, but getting this into the mainstream is very important. Simplify, simplify, simplify. What I tell my physicians is simplify. Getting people to eat, move, and think drives 90% of disease. Whole food plant-based eating by and large is the cornerstone. Regular physical activity, 30 minutes a day of physical activity at least. Strength building is also is nice to do. Do I have a purpose in my life? Do I have a passion? Do I have a friend? Am I connected? Right? Social isolation is a major risk factor. All of those things. Do I know stress reduction? Right? Besides kicking my dog or my cat, all due respect to my veterinarian friends, what do I do? Mindfulness training, spirituality, deep rhythmic breathing. This is it, this one slide, eat, move, think. And when you add up all of the, the requisites for a healthy diet, where do they live? They live in Plants, largely the way they grow in nature, minimal processing through an industrial, where we add the three American food groups, salt, sugar, and fat. Shift right. Shift right. So when I show this to doctors tomorrow morning, 250 of them at the Chatham Marriott for the Family Medicine Board Review course, they will say, in general, we live on the left column, we must move our patients to the right, and doctor, heal thyself by beginning to do so yourself. Systems around the country are being bolder. Kaiser Permanente gives a brochure to all of their patients. Eat plants, no equivocation. All the websites in the back, you don't need any special diets, you don't need any special doctors. It's the healthiest way to live. If you go to the Canadian Food Guide, as I did last week. This is the picture that appears on the cover for all Canadians, which as far as I can tell is us. It's just north of here. There's things you won't see on the Canadian Food Guide. Okay? We don't see a lot of references to meat or dairy, not to say that you can't have some, right? But differentiating what is the marketing function versus a health function is something they do cleaner in Canada. You heard Dr. Who last night talk about the effects of removing environmental statements from the food guide. Canada doesn't have that problem, okay? They also market a lot of good things internationally as it relates to animal products and dairy products, but when it comes to advising health professionals and the public in Canada, this is what the food guide looks like. Yesterday was all about experiences. When Richard and Sarah talked about the four hot topics when we came up, unless we can make it experiential, doctor, your patients won't change. So what can you do to link them to experiential programs or health coaching in order to improve their skills? They've got to be able to know, they've got to believe that they can change, and they've got to have a skill set to be able to do it. That's why we do health coaching at UPMC. 22,000 patients have received a prescription from folks like Dr. Snyder, from folks like myself, prescribing engagement for lifestyle coaching, plant-based eating, physical activity, mindfulness, diabetes management, asthma care. Because when you prescribe it, patients think it's serious, because it is, right? 1,300 physicians have used this program, 22,000 patients across Western Pennsylvania. And physicians are going even more to root cause. Several of our colleagues here today are board certified now in lifestyle medicine. So there are intensive disease reversal programs around plant-based eating, physical activity, and mindfulness. Because when you look at all these diseases, you look at a lot of these recurrent procedures, intensive attention, similar to what Dr. Williams and others said, to people who are already sick can actually help reduce the reoccurrence of these conditions and reduce the cost and the personal tragedy that comes with conditions that shouldn't recur. 
Epigenetics is the new science. I will tell my physician colleagues tomorrow morning that this is a science that didn't exist when I was in medical school. The rapid expression of proteins literally within hours of meals that you eat or habits that you undertake begins to change the way your body reacts and reduces that inflammation. You need to know that it's powerful, it exists, but you have to become a student of this science. So the punchlines to those doctors, and I'm closing down here, is food truly is the best medicine. Eat real food, not too much, mostly plants, was so right, Michael Pollan years ago. You cannot put fruits, vegetables, whole grains, all of these things in pills, they're not. With all due respect to the supplement industry, many of them are dangerous and they're not even necessary. Okay? Beware diets, reductionist, simplistic, the cabbage diet, the ketogenic, the blah, 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 blah diet. If the D word is there, put up a yellow warning flag, okay? Chronic disease is reversible with food as medicine. Think about doctors who are serious about behavior change to help you become knowledgeable about things like lifestyle medicine. And guess what? It's good for your kids and grandkids because they'll live in a cleaner environment. If we move those ways, like the Eat Lancet report that we heard about, absolutely we'll do those things. All of the patients that come before you are undernourished. They may be overweight, but they're undernourished. What can you do to get them to eat, move, and think better? A brief motivational message, whole food as it's grown, plant-based sources, link them to those box gardens if you know about them in their community. Prescribe coaching and walk the talk. Why should I do this if my doctor doesn't? And so a lot of what we do is try to encourage our physician colleagues to get more knowledgeable and begin to change and move in this direction and see the beneficial effects so they become better doctors to their patients. It's not that diabetes, heart disease, and obesity runs in your family. Nobody runs in your family. <laughs> we learn our habits from our family. It's not in our genes. Less than 3 to 5%, except for rare conditions. It's not in your genes. Maybe in your blue genes, but it's not in your gene genes. Okay, and some references. Thank you.